All right, so good afternoon, everybody, and people who are watching this later. Um, before we uh, before we dig into today's text, um, I want to share with you this book that I think, um, uh, while I'm not necessarily using it for, for our classes, I think is an important sort of layer into the conversation we're having. It's this book called Torah Tamima. This is just the volume for Shmot. Um, and what Torah Tamima does is it takes each verse from the uh, Torah. It's framed like a uh, Mikra Ot Gedolo, which may not be familiar to you, but it takes a page and at the top here has the verse uh, from the Torah. Here it has the Unkelos Aramaic translation. It has Rashi here at the bottom. And then this section called Torah Tamima makes references to Talmud and to Midrash based on every verse. So it's very much kind of like what we're doing together, um, but this has been around a much longer and, and is much more uh, comprehensive than what we're doing. It reference, it, tr it it's not perfect, right? It's not using the computer and all sorts of different analyses, but it has really great references. And here at the bottom is the BU or the explanation. And so while it's not exactly what we're doing in class, it's very much, um, what we're doing is very much inspired by it. Um, and this doesn't make distinctions between different types of Talmud. Um, on this random page, which is chapter 12 uh, from Parshat Bo next week, um, uh, 12, 13, um, tell all the people of, uh, of Israel to, to, you know, to, uh, you know, count, count the, the, the tribes. And here it has a reference to Parshat Psachim, or from Psachim, the Talmud of Psachim, and um, uh, the uh, different sections uh, here. Um, this one's got Kiddushin and all sorts of other Michilta, other different types of Tanaitic and Amoraic uh, sources. So that's the Torah Tamima, um, which I think is uh, an interesting resource. And, and, and again, sort of as we start to really un understand how Talmud is, and, and, and Midrash and other kinds of things are interconnected, interwoven into the way we understand Judaism writ large. Um, resources like this, Torah Tamima, is, um, is a powerful thing to know about. Um, but that's uh, we're not we're going to talk about today. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, the bracho, uh, uh, to a couple of particular bracho blessings um, over food. And um, it, uh, it comes from uh, this week's parsha in, in just a slight little bit of wordplay but it's very much talking about what are the sort of the rules around um, what blessings we say. And it's going to start off with a conversation about the blessing we say over bread, <laughs> which is uh, a <laughs> Motsi or Hamotzi um, blessing, um, which is generally translated, who brought forth bread from the earth, Hamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz. Um, but we'll talk about how that's actually not as simple as it appears. And then we'll move along to um, some other blessings um, over uh, different kinds of food, in particular vegetables. Um, this comes from a tractate, Tractate Brachot, uh, which is uh, the very first tractate in the Talmud and is um, all about different types of blessings. And in particular, it starts off in a conversation about the Shema. So that's not what we're talking about today, but the, the Masecha Brachot begins with a conversation about the Shema and, and it sort of extends through different types of blessings. Um, before we jump into today's, today's text, any questions about uh, what I've said thus far about Torah Tzmima, Masecha Brachot, things like that? Okay, great. Um, so we're here again looking at our, uh, our text from Masecha Brachot. Um, and it begins with um, a, a quote from the Mishnah, She'al hapat, you know, for stuff on bread, who Omer, a person says, hamotzi, right? That's how it intervichule, et cetera. That is how our, uh, our text begins, as it gives us the instructions on how to, um, to say a blessing over bread. Um, can I get a volunteer to, uh, to read First, this nice big paragraph in English. Yeah, but I don't know if it's before me. starting to read. Can, can I ask a question? As long as we're talking about mozi, what uh, yes. what what foods do you say mozi over? Because I I know we're saying mozi at the synagogue because we're serving pita, but.
But if we're serving crackers, we don't say mozi. We uh, say the, the other one. Okay, great. Uh, we'll take a moment to talk about that before I jump in. Karen, I saw that you were saying something as well. Oh, I couldn't see your, your screen share, but now I can. So okay, great. I okay, thought good. it was me. All right, good. I'm glad, I'm glad it got resolved. Uh, so uh, without any intention to... Uh, so first of all, I would direct you back to Rabbi Hal in terms of which blessings you sh say for which foods at your synagogue. Um, uh, certainly he's uh, the Marida Atra, the one who's going to make the kind of those kinds of decisions. And so I'll refer you back to him for decision making. Uh, bread, it, so hamotzi is generally referred to anything that is a bread. So made from the five grains, the things that we do not eat uh, on Passover or the leavened versions of them as it were, which is um, uh, wheat, uh, oats, spelt, rye, and uh, now I'm not remembering the fifth one. There's a fifth one. One of you will remember and, and remind me. So there are those five grains. No, I can't remember what the fifth one is off the top of my head. Um, uh, the distinction between the blessing hamotzi over bread and a blessing over something made from those grains, but not bread, which is um, the blessing mizonot. Bere me name is a note. And so the question of why is this item that's made from the same things, but I don't say mozi, is generally because it's not a bread. So a cracker is not a bread, and therefore you would say a different blessing because the relationship between the blessing and the item is in, in alignment. Does that make sense, Ron? Silence as agreement as the Talmud says. Um, I know you're- Silence was, I, I got- uh, jelly on my fingers, and I was trying not to touch my mouse. Um, That's very reasonable. I know you're making lunch right now. Um, uh, um, so no, uh, no, it 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 makes sense, but it doesn't make sense because to me, pita isn't bread either. Uh, sure. Well, I'll refer you back to Hal in terms of how Rabbi Hal and so on, uh, in, in in terms of how he makes that decision. Um, but as far as I understand, uh, in my very inexperience about bread. Uh, is that uh, Peter is risen and therefore it is bread. But again, I, I refer you back to him and the nuances there. Um, all right, we're going to study Talmud today. Can I get a volunteer to read this first paragraph? I guess Great, I'll Karen. read it. Uh, we'll we go to Karen and then David, I'll get you the oh, next one. I'm sorry, one. who's reading? Uh, Karen's going to read, but I'll get you on the next one. Okay, great. Appreciate and, it. And I Googled it, it's barley. The fifth. Oh, barley. Thank you. But I can't. Rabbi take Google that comes that in for the win. Yes. Um, amazing. Thank you, Karen. So that's right. So that's wheat, barley, oats, spelt, and rye. All right, right. Karen, please. Okay. We learned in the Mishnah that over bread, one recites, Who brings forth bread from the earth? The sages taught in a Braita. What does one who eats bread recite before eating? Who brings forth hamotzi, bread from the earth? Rebbe Nechemia says that the blessing is phrased, who brought forth bread from the earth. All right, pause. Before we get to Rava, what do we have here? We have a quote from the Mishnah, right? What does one say over bread? Hamotzi lechemina aretz, who brings forth bread from the earth? The sages, right, teach in a brita, and we talked about a brita because a brita is a Tanaitic source, but not in the Mishnah, that affirms the same thing from the Mishnah in the name of the sages. And um, as we were talking about um, much earlier, the beginning of the course over the summer, um, the sages are the majority opinion. And so when we, we're talking about what, what do we do when it says the sages, we are, we sh not we should, but generally we are inclined to say, oh, that's the majority opinion and one we should follow. Um, again, we know that minority opinions have value and, and in some cases we follow those. Um, but in terms of the sort of the internal logic of the Talmud, that's the, the, um, the, the majority opinion. We then get a minority opinion from Rabbi Nehemia, who says, it's not ha motzi, it's motzi lechemina It's dropping the hey before ha motzi. Is everybody with me so far? Are we with the text so far? Okay. So here we already know, we now have a conflict, right? In the story of our sugya, we have a conflict because we have one uh, a majority opinion that says ha and a minority opinion that says motzi. Okay, Karen, please continue. Rava said. 
Okay, so Rava said, everyone agrees that the term motzi means brought in the past tense, as it is written, God who brought them forth from Egypt is for them like the horns of the wild ox. Um, when do they disagree with regards to the term hamotzi, as the rabbis hold it, hamotzi means that God brought forth, as in the, in the past tense, as it is written, who brought forth for you water from a rock of flint, which depicts a past event. All right, pause. Okay, so we've got um, Rava who says, and I love this term, is a great one, kule alma la pligi. Kule alma, everybody in the world, kol ha'olam, pligi means to disagree, doesn't disagree. So kol alma la pligi would mean everybody agrees. Everyone in the world agrees that motzi means brought in the sense that it, it, it's a past tense verb, right? So it's not brings, it's brought. And therefore, right, we, uh, therefore we're starting to get a sense of where the disagreement is, which is about tense. So then we have the question, the disagreement isn't about the word motzi, which means past tense, I guess, it seems like. The question the rabbis then always wanna ask is, well, where are they disagreeing? Ki pligi. Where is the disagreement? Well, disagreement says, well, hamotzi means brought forth in the past tense as well. So now we have a problem. It's like, what's the real disagreement here? Because it seems like we might make the argument hamotzi means present tense, hamotzi lechaminarets, who brings forth present tense bread from the earth, and motzi, which means past tense. So we've got this sort of issue because the rabbis are saying, well, it also means past tense. So we don't have, you know, what, why are we making this distinction? And now we're going to have Rabbi Nehemia share as his. Karen, keep going. Um, Rabbi Nehemia holds that the term hamotzi means that God brings forth in the present tense, as it is stated in Moses' prophecy to the Jewish people in Egypt. And you will know that I am the Lord your God who is bringing you forth from under the burdens of Egypt. Since in that context, hamotzi is used with regard to an event transpiring in the present, or possibly even one that will transpire in the future, it's inappropriate to include this term in a blessing referencing the past. Okay. I disagree so here, with that. Well, let, let's come back. Let's just make sure we are on the same page. So what Neche Rebbe Nehemiah says is the problem, the, the challenge, the difficulty we're having is that motzi right, means past tense, who brought forth bread from the earth. And we have evidence that hamotzi means present tense, right? And the evidence comes from this week's Parsha, where, uh, where um, God tells Moses, I will bring out, I will bring you from the burdens of Egypt, using the same verb, hamotzi. And so, and that seems to be in the present or even future tense. And so the question is, when I'm saying a blessing, does tense matter? Like one of the questions I'm, I'm interested in us discussing is what is the theological statement about saying a blessing that's phrased in the past tense versus the present tense? I'm not sure there's a clear answer. I think, I think it's worthy of, of explanation. Does everybody feel like they understand the disagreement here? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna rephrase it just as summary. We have uh, two options to say the blessing over bread. One option is hamotzi, and one option is motzi, without the hay. The question is, what's the difference between the two? Yeah. But doesn't it make more sense to go into the past because the bread is, was made in the past? It's not something that you're making in the future. I think that is a solid argument for... Um, for why we a past tense understanding makes sense. Like, I think that's a solid argument. It already happened. The bread is made. When I'm eating it, I'm not, make, I'm not about to make bread. We have one nuance here, which is that the rabbis hold, oops, that hamotzi means uh, past tense as well. So we've got an argument that hamotzi means present tense or past tense, and motzi only means past tense so far. So if we've got the little units of our argument, those are the different pieces. Is everybody with it so far? Loosely, generally? Yeah, but to me, the, the 
argument would be, are you blessing the fact that, that like creation, that God created that, or are you blessing what you're eating? Say more. Um, well, the past tense to me, and I understand what Bill said, that, that the bread, we're not making the bread now, the bread was made, but you're still blessing what you're eating in the present versus are you blessing the fact that God created the wheat or the whatever grain um, in order for you to have the bread? I think, I think you're both right in, un, in pulling apart what this argument is saying, because it is true, right? If I'm eating this bread, I'm doing so in the present tense, and I'm engaging with this in the present tense, and God has brought it to me in this moment. At the same time, Bill, you've got a good argument here to say, okay, yeah, but all that bread was made, and here I am. Nelson, I see you. Uh, I, I was maybe on, on Karen's side, I'm not sure. Um, you can't say the blessing and eat at the same time. So I assume the eating follows the blessing. Why can't you eat just before the blessing? Um, there's a time paradox here. Uh, right. Well, okay. we can... Number one, Bill took what I wanted to say about the, the bread was made in the past. Um, but the other thing I was gonna bring up, um, to answer Nelson is normally you say the blessing and then you do the act. The, the big major exception is lighting Shabbat candles. That's number, exactly that's the next thing. But the other sure. thing is, let's not get all bent out of shape about tense here because in, the, in, the ter in terms of God, God has no tense. He, he's, he's, every, he's, he's in the past tense, the future tense, and the present tense all at the same time. So he doesn't care what tense we're talking about. Yeah, so I think as long as we're blessing him, then it does the tense doesn't matter. Um yes, yes and no. I mean, I think the tense is a part of the argument. So clearly there's some value in understanding it. I think Nelson to your point about the paradox, in some sense since we do say a blessing before we do the act as as, as Ron said the uh, major exception is Shabbat candles, that perhaps we should be saying this blessing in the future tense that God will bring forth bread in, uh, uh, from the earth and I'm gonna eat it as soon as I'm done eating it, right? So um, uh, I think that, I, I do think tense is a theological statement that we are making. Now, Ron, I think to your point, it may not matter. Like this blessing can be said any which way. We could say hamotzi, we could say motzi, we could say yim so, right? We could say all sorts of different things. Ron, your argument is saying, it doesn't matter which tense, because God is present in all of those. But I do think we make a theological statement, right? So Ron, your statement is, it doesn't matter. All of the tenses fulfill your, you know, the theological statement you wanna make. But I do think there's a, a, a question of what is our relationship to God? What is our relationship to creation? What are we, what are we saying when we say a blessing? That those are all rolled in here to this, this I think, a lot of question that we're unpacking. Let's keep going. Let's see what yeah, If it was the future, we'd be blessing the bread we'd be eating next week. <laughs> I, all right. I mean, I think that would, I think that makes sense, right? That would, that would be a challenge. How can you say a blessing for something that might not happen? Well, yeah. When you, when you, when you say the blessing over wine, is that the same argument? Um, uh, so in that, in that case, right. Um, it, it is, we, so Bore Pri Hagafen, creator of the fruit of the vine we like we could make the argument that it should be habore the one who creates or created like i think it is true i wouldn't say that's true with shabbat candles because that framework is asher kitshanu b'mitzvitav v'tzivanu right we are commanded by god to do a thing as distinct from food blessings which are very much who create god who created it Right? It's not that we are commanded to eat bread, although in some cases we are, um, uh, and, and sort of the nuance there. I, I was thinking of matzah. It's not quite bread, but we are definitely commanded to, uh, to eat it. And the blessing reflects that. Yeah, David. So I, I don't want to jump ahead if that's what I'm doing, or maybe I, well, I'll just say what I'm going to say, which is 
I think it's kind of interesting in a way that we're worried about the tense, but I almost think it's more fundamental to worry about why this is the appropriate blessing for bread at all. Brings forth bread from the earth uh, or brought forth. Either way, the process of getting bread is a little more complicated than bringing it forth from the earth. So it's kind of making an interesting statement at all that it's brings, you know, we're used to it. We always say this. So maybe we don't even think twice, but now that we're looking at it, that's an, you know, it's not, uh, uh, you know, who made the grain available for us to make bread or something like that. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I mean, yes, we, we do not have bread farms, right? We have grain farms that have grain and we make bread from it. And um, the thing we are blessing is something that is processed. Um, so I do think the blessing itself is um, uh, has a challenge in it uh, for us. I don't think the sugya goes there, but it's an interest. It is an interesting question we are making. Um, I was just talking about this with my niece um, uh, uh, last week or two weeks ago. All right, David, you were next anyway. Why don't you read this next paragraph? So sure. the, the challenge, the question that the Gemara is going to ask is we've got the rabbis who say, right? The rabbis say that Hamosi means okay. God brought forth in the past okay. tense, right? So we have to resolve, right? Rabbi Nehemia says that it's in the present tense. So we have a problem, which is how do the rabbis prove their case? And, and, and here, uh, David, you're going to read right here. Okay. Uh, and the rabbis, how do they respond to that proof? The sages interpret that verse to right, I'm me sorry. that the proof that they're talking about is this second is this verse from Exodus, sort of proving that Hamotzi is in the present tense. Please go on. Okay. Uh, the sages interpret that verse to mean that the Holy One, blessed be He, said to Israel as follows: When I bring you forth, I will perform something for you that that you will know that I am the one who brought you forth from Egypt as it is written. And you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you forth, Hamotzi. In this verse too, Hamotzi refers to the past. Great. So here, what do the rabbis say uh, about the fact that the reference in, in our Parsha um, that I brought forth from the burdens of Egypt is in the present tense, which is we have another a phrase right? Or, or we say in other cases, right? And you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you forth is also is now in the past tense. So we have competing examples here in which this tense matters. And, and I love this. Now we're going to get a little story um, yeah, when, speaking to this. Yeah, Bill. Yeah, well, what we say, let's go say the motzi over the bread. We don't say, let's go say the hamotzi over the bread. We, you are correct, in fact, that we do refer to the blessing as motzi. But when we recite it, almost all of us say hamotzi. Um, and 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 here we're actually about to get a, a story from the uh, from the Talmud on this exact issue. So, um, yeah, David, R Rabbi, is this before I continue? Is this literally a a sort of a grammatical point because the particle ha usually means the, but here it seems to be a question about whether it means something about the tense of what follows. Yeah, so uh, it is about grammar. And when you add a hey, it does make something the. Um, it's also true that a, all right, so motzi comes from the verb lehotzi, which means to, br to bring forth. And so we would say in the past tense, right? Ilu hotzi hotzi anu, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, who brought us forth. That hotzi is past tense for sure. But the, the verb is in a he feel form, right? So le hotzi becomes motzi in the present. So it very much the word motzi itself is actually present tense, not really past tense. The challenge is that in the Torah, um, the, the, um, the tenses get all uh, backwards. Verbs that look like they're future are really past. Past ones are really future. So it all gets screwy in the Torah itself. When mm. you add the hey in front of a present tense verb in the third person singular, it often becomes the name of the person who does the thing. 
So Hamoti becomes the one who does the taking out. Is everybody with me so far? So Hamotzi then refers to God, right? The one who is taking out the bread from the earth, the Israelites from Egypt, whatever. It refers to the person who is doing that work. Um, uh, let me think if I can think of another uh, example um, off the top of my head. Um, No, nope, off the top of my head, I can't think of another one, but it, but that is a principle. And, and I'm, I'm sure another one will come to me. Um, the reason why the blessing over wine, bore peri hagafen, is that it's um uh it's a smichut, it's a it's a, it's a combination of words. So it's not ha bore, the one who brings forth um uh the fruit of the vine. It's the creator of the fruit of the vine. Bore peri hagafen. It's like uh, it's about um, the 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 words. The fruit of the vine are are um, uh, are describing the 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 person who's doing the act, as opposed to the one who takes out who creates wine uh, a fruit of the earth. I know that's like deep grammar and it's not super duper interesting, but that's what they're doing here, which is that the ha makes it the person who does the thing. Okay. Okay, I know, sorry, that was a little bit of a grammatical detour. So here we go, we have this question, which is Hamotzi is past or it's maybe present. And the argument here that, that, um, that Rava has is that everyone agrees that Motzi refers to the past tense, even though it, 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 it's sort of strange that it does that in the first place. So we're gonna accept that everybody agrees that Motzi is in the past tense. All right, David, keep going. On that note. On that note, the Gemara relates the sages would praise Son of Rav Zevid, brother of Rabbi Shmuel Bar Rav Zevid, to Rabbi Zera, uh, that he is a great man and he is expert in blessings. Rabbi Zera said to the stages, sages, pardon me, when I come to you, bring him to me so that I can meet him. One day he happened to come before him. They brought out bread to the guest. He began and recited, who brought forth mozi bread from the earth. Rabbi Zera grew annoyed and said, this is he of whom they say he is a great man and expert in blessings? Granted, had he recited Hamotzi, I would have understood that he thereby taught us the meaning of the verse, who brought you forth from Egypt, and he thereby taught us that the halacha is in accordance with the opinion of the rabbis. However, what did he teach us by reciting Motzi? Everyone agrees that one fulfills his obligation when reciting Motzi. All right, pause, are... pause, pause. Okay. Because I want to unpack this. So we've got this story. The Gemara, the sages would say, the son of Rav Zevid, the brother of Rabbi Shmuel Bar Zevid, right? Um, uh, uh, as this as this expert in blessings, they would tell Rabbi Zera about this. They would say, oh, you know, they're all going around. Oh, this guy, he's this amazing expert in blessings. He knows what's up. He studied the halacha. He's he's the guy. So Rabbi Zera says to them, great, when he shows up, bring him to me. And he encounter, he basically creates this test. So they happens to show up, Rabbi Zera is there. And so what do they do? They bring out bread to see what he does. Because we want to know, is he going to say mozi or ha mozi? Now, we already know that everyone agrees that mozi means in, um, uh, brought. What we don't know until this story is that mozi works for everyone, that is acceptable for everyone. And so the question becomes, is hamotzi kosher for every, kosher also? We didn't know that before this, now we know it. So it says this, he showed up, he, uh, they gave him bread, and he said, mozi lecha min haaretz. He doesn't say hamotzi. Rabbi Zeir, I love the fact that we've got like personality here. Rabbi Zeir is getting annoyed according to Rabbi Steinsalt. <laughs> He's like, this guy, this guy's the expert in blessings? And here's the argument he makes. If he had recited Hamotzi, we would know, right, that he was teaching us that this, that Hamotzi was kosher. But since he said Motzi, and it's acceptable to everyone already, which we did not already know, he's not teaching us anything new. Which of course is like, a, like, like he had no way to win in that case, right? Like either he's telling us, he's approving a minority opinion, or he's proving the majority opinion. It's like, where does he get stuck? 
Um, and so, uh, um, well, sorry, we, I got a weird notification from Zoom. So if we get cut off, come back. Um, uh, and so what does the Gemara explain? How do we resolve this issue about Motzi versus Hamotzi? David, you want to read it for us? The Gemara explains the son of Rav Zeved did this in order to preclude himself from taking sides in the dispute. He preferred to phrase his blessing in a manner appropriate according to all opinions rather than teach a novel concept which is not universally accepted. Keep reading the next one. The Gemara concludes, and the halacha is that one recites who brings forth hamotzi, bread from the earth, as we hold in accordance with the opinion of the rabbis who say that it also means who brought forth. Okay. Uh, so there are wow. two pieces here. So the Gemara says, we have a disagreement. And Rav, the son of Rav Zavid says, I want no part of this disagreement. I don't want to get in the middle. I don't want to take sides. So I'm saying motzi because it's the safe option. We know that it works. And then the Gemara, which, you know, it doesn't always do. It tells us what the halacha is. It gives us an answer. Like that never happens to the Talmud. Everyone could just breathe a sigh of relief. Ah, the Talmud has actually given us an answer, not just a disagreement. It says, Halchata, the law is Hamotzi Lachamina Aretz. Because we accept that the rabbis say it also means past tense. Which tells us that the rabbis are more interested in it being past tense versus present tense. The theological statement of the rabbis is here that the past tense matters. It could be for the reason that Bill and Karen mentioned, right? That like it's already been made and here we are. Or that, um, you know, we, uh, we're going to say it when we're going to eat it. We will have already said it. and Therefore, the blessing works. There's all sorts of different options. But the rabbis are making clear. Past tense matters. And, it's, and the blessing is hamotzi lechem min yeah. Right. yeah, Bill. Yeah, well, what's what's a blessing over liquor? It's not the shakol niya bidvaro. It's not ha bidvaro. But on the wine, it's hagafen, which just seems like they're two the similar thing, but two different things. Yeah, I mean, the blessings are constructed. The grammar of the blessings are constructed very differently when we might expect them to be similar. Shehakol that everything nihie is made bidvaro between uh, by God's word, right? In this case, it's passive nihie is made, right? It's it's not it's not even in the same structure of, you know, the one who makes everything, right? Or the one who made everything, as the case may be, right? It's not, right? Uh, habara etakol, the one who created everything, um, or you know whatever some version thereof habore. Hakol. Other thoughts? Do people agree? Do people, I mean, we know that, that the custom now and the halacha is hamotzi. Do people feel like we, we should have done something different? Yeah, Karen, and then David. I, I'm confused. Okay, great. If what, Rav, what are you confused by? Rav Zevid was the big macher, the, the one who knew everything. And he didn't want to take sides in the dispute. So there was a dispute, and he said motzi. But now we're saying ha motzi as if there was no dispute. Ah, great. So um, here's what we're going to do. Uh, give me a sec here. I'm going to open up a note, and we're going. I'm going to write it out. We're going to write it out together because I think this is the way to go. I'm very visual, so you guys. Am I gonna... the only one that's confused? No, it, it, let's clarify it. It doesn't matter if. Um, we're all on the same page here together. Here we go. I'm going to write a new note. We're going to do it together, right? So we have the argument, right? Which is, um, we learn from this that the um, at the beginning of the sugya, we have the, the sages say, Hamotzi is correct, right? And then we get the argument that um, uh, uh, Rabbi Nehemiah says, Motzi is correct because it is in the past tense. Then, right, we get the argument. Rava says, everyone uh, agrees that motzi is past tense. Oops, right? And uh, um, uh, 
Give me a sec here. Um, and then rabbis say, or sages say, hamotzi is also past tense. You with me so far? Is this helpful? Okay. Then we get Rabbi Nehemia again, who says, hamotzi is present tense. And so now we have a problem, right? They disagree, right, about this, this piece here. So then the question is, and here we're going to do the Gemara. It's, the, in the, um, it's called the Stam Gemara. The Stam Gemara is the uh, anonymous voice of the Talmud. It's the narrator, if you will, right? It doesn't, it do, it's, it's everybody. It's not the sages. It's, it's just the narrator. And what does the Stam Gemara says? What do the, the sages do about the present tense proof text, right? That's the question. And here's the answer, right? Uh, sages say, Amotzi is also in the past tense. They don't even, they don't reject the old thing. They say, look, it's also, we also have proof that it's in the past tense. And so then we have Rav Zevid uh, 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 and, and the story we hear, right? Is that we have Rabbi Zera who says, Everyone knows that mozi is a kosher blessing. Okay? And so the question is, what does the son of Rav Zevid do? Does he say hamotzi or mozi? Because we have the sages, the majority opinion that say this, that hamotzi is correct. And we have um, uh, Rabbi Nehemiah who says Motsi is correct. So what does he do? What, what does he choose? He says Motsi, oops. Uh, the son of Rav Zevid says, uh, recites Motsi because everyone knows it works. And therefore, he's not in the disagreement because if he says Hamotzi, he's doing it. But that's all, again, that's already a problem because the, this is the majority opinion. So we've got this de dilemma between the minority opinion and the majority opinion that the minority opinion is already accepted, but the majority opinion isn't. It's strange. It's a strange framing. And so what we get here is the Stam Gemara coming at the end and saying, what's the final ruling? Amotzi. It's a bit strange. Talmud is not as linear as we hope it to be. We wanted to close every loop at the end, but it doesn't quite do that. But it does give us an answer, right? Because, and then the reason is why, this is, you know, subtext here. We want the sages to be right. Does that make sense, Karen? Yeah, I, I actually had it backwards in my head where Motsi, where the sages said, I'm glad, thank you for the chart, because yeah. I, I had that Motsi was the original one that was correct and that the the um, conflict was, was on, on Motsi. So I had the whole thing backwards. Thank That's you. That's okay. I'm really glad you asked so that we could go over it and I can make this chart. Uh, David and then Ron. So a couple of observations and then the question. One is that obviously they're taking this incredibly seriously if they're having an argument about what tense is it in at all and then com coming up with the idea that it's sort of both tenses so we're okay. So they're really serious about it. Uh, whereas at this stage of time where we've been saying hamotzi for, if you will, ever, we don't even think twice. Correct. And then the second thing is just it seems like, and I'll ask you whether you think this is what's going on, or maybe I'm just reading into it, but it, it seems like whatever passage of time has happened between the sages and and maybe the Mishnah in this case and, and the Gemara, we're, we're having a group of people who feel a lot like maybe we are in the sense that some of us have some Hebrew, some of us have no Hebrew, some of us can read it and not understand it, some of us can understand it a little but not a lot, some of us understand it really well, um, but we're all saying hamotzi. It almost feels as if, 
at least for some of these people, it's like, well, I said Motsi. Well, I said Ha Motsi. I don't know. I'm, I mean, maybe I don't understand tenses after all. Uh, much like maybe today, some of us uh, who are enough removed from studying Hebrew would say, now I'm trying to remember, which tense is that? Uh, it just feels that way. I don't know if you think that's what's going on or it's something different, but uh, it all—it feels like we're we're kindred spirits in in in, uh, in it, not just by descent, but from actually experiencing the same kind of uh, situation. After all, they were speaking Aramaic, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, certainly, their vernacular anyway wasn't Hebrew at the time, so. Uh, Maybe this isn't that far-fetched after all. Yeah, I mean, the rabbis spend a tremendous amount of time in a variety of different places unpacking the etymology of words and where it comes from and what's the right thing. And I do think that mirrors very much the kinds of conversations we have, even if um, you know our relationship to Hebrew is different. Um, all the time, the rabbis are saying, we have this word, where does this come from? And some of them will tell a weird story, or I heard a guy once say it. And it's like, what? This is what you know. They didn't have dictionaries per se, um, and so um, I do think uh, I think that we. It's a great I think it's a great observation that rabbis are people. <laughs> the rabbis of the Talmud were people, and um, and that they were having similar conversations. I mean, I, I feel like the story actually, in some ways, backs that up because you know, oh, we're going to bring the expert who really knows about this. We'll see what he does when we put bread in front of him. Uh, it's like an experiment, right? We're going to experiment. Here's a piece of bread. What are you going to say? Oh, he said that. <laughs> exactly. Right. It's exactly right, and I love that. At the end, he, the, the lesson we get is that he doesn't want to get in the middle. He doesn't want to be in the role that they've pushed him into, which, again, is this fascinating conversation uh, all by itself. Uh, Ron and then Nelson. All right. So what we have here is the the um, both opinion, apparently both opinions are right. It reminds me of the the, the committee on law and standards where, you know, it only takes six votes to pass something. You can, you can have two diametrically opposed opinions that are both acceptable. And, and the, but the other thing is, you know, when we talk about doing this bracha, I can tell you multiple times I've heard we have to do moti or you can't talk until you do moti or blah, blah, blah. Or do you want to say moti? And, and then we say ha moti. We don't say moti, we say ha moti. So we, even today, we're using it both ways. Mm. The bracha says ha moti, but when we talk about the bracha, it's moti. Yeah, I, I, Bill made a reference to that earlier, right? We, we do really hold both of these truths, these correct opinions in some way, right? Even though across the board, we use hamotzi, as you and, and, and Bill said, right? Mo, we refer to it often as motzi. Um, and I, you know, I have to tell you, until this moment, that always sort of rubbed me the wrong way. And now it doesn't have to, right? Like both were right from the beginning. Um, uh, it's nice when Talmud can make you feel better. All right, Nelson. I have three things I want to say. Uh, first, I thought when he didn't want to take an opinion, he was just being polite. He knew it, they were all charged up and he didn't want to, he was just going to let them, leave them alone. Uh, second of all, this discussion part reminds me of a poster I saw yesterday. I was in a restaurant and it said, uh, they told me I could name my, my salary whatever I wanted. And I named mine Fred. Um, and we named the bracha Motsi, but we don't necessarily say it. it just, it's not that the name is in conflict. It's just a name. It gets us to the right territory. We all know what we're talking about. What the exact wording is, we could keep changing it. But third of all, I thought really what we're stepping into is Ron's problem from earlier, which is that God doesn't have a tense. And so we're really trying to put a tense on God and that's always paradoxical. So we're never gonna be entirely satisfied. It really doesn't matter uh, what the action we're, we're trying to describe. I, I think, I, I, I yes. Um, I think that um, in part, what we're learning is that the rabbis want it. 
everyone seems to want it in the past tense, even if the language is inconsistent that way. And so we do learn a little bit about what the rabbis cared about in terms of the tenses. And I think to, 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 to your points, uh, you, you and Ron, it doesn't actually matter, right? In the sense that um, both answers end up being correct, even if it's not for the reason we would have assigned to it. And I think uh, the, third, the third thing I wanna pull, draw out is the, the distinction between the name and the act, right? that those things are related. I, I like the way you framed it, right? It's, it puts us in the right territory, but it doesn't necessarily you know, lead to the instruction. And, um, and, and I think that there's something then powerful for us to, not necessarily today, but to talk about, right? Which is the power of names, right? Interestingly enough, uh, we had a name for God earlier in it, right? As I'm just gonna share, share my screen here again, right? How did the rabbis respond? They responded, the Holy One, blessed be God, right? They didn't say Hashem, Hamakom. They didn't say any of those other names. They used the Kudshabrihu. There it is in the Aramaic. The Kudshabrihu, the blessing, right? The Holy Blessing One, as, um, as uh, my, my rabbi, Rabbi uh, Brad Artson likes to say, he moves it into the present tense, right? Because there is this powerful naming, layering statement we're making, right? The holy blessed one and the holy blessing one, um, as Rabbi Artson says, that is a statement to the point, which is, does time matter? Does the tense matter? What do we as human beings take from that nuance, even if God doesn't, it doesn't impact God? Because in so many ways, the blessings aren't really about God, they're really about us, right? The blessings are about our relationship to food and our relationship to God and our relationship to um, you know, the past as it were, right? History and, and narrative and, and, and our, you know, what have you. When framed about us, then we get, a, I think a little bit of clarity of saying, well, what is it that I am emphasizing here? The rabbis seem to say, we are emphasizing something that occurred in the past that we are currently honoring as distinct from something that is happening as we're talking, right? We know that the rabbis understand that we are co-creators of the universe, right? God is creating with us. And so it's interesting for them to then say the past tense is the phrasing we want, even though we now know that the language can be a little bit bendy. Um, again, I, 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 I prompt all this, not because I, I want to stake a theological claim because I really don't. I, I, I think the, these are, when we ask ourselves these kinds of questions, we start to peel back, what do the rabbis say? What is it that I want to say? What is it that I believe? What is it that I don't believe? Um, all those things become fodder for us to deepen our relationship with God and, and, and find a theological place for each of us individually to, to live. Yeah, Karen. So I'm going to throw some mud into the clarity. Yes, I love it. Okay. God didn't make the bread. God made the wheat. We made the bread. Yeah. 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 Uh, David made a similar point earlier. So what do you do with that? Karen, I'm throwing it back to you. How, how do we deal with that? Roll in the mud with me here. All right. So you're, you're blessing the bread, the lechem. So what, are we really blessing how we, you know, back to the old tikkun olam, how we um, work together with God to take the original. That would, that would, for me, argue it back to um, making it past tense because God made the wheat. And then when we're, we're doing tikkun, we're making the bread out of the wheat. Mm. Maybe so. Maybe it makes it present tense. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I think. But maybe. But maybe that's why Hamotzi is such a powerful answer yeah. because it merges those two, which is that we have examples of present and past tense with that verb, and yeah. therefore we're actually holding both of those simultaneously. Oh. Right. It's yeah, not. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe yeah. that's where we're really supposed to take that. Motzi is sufficient, but it doesn't necessarily capture everything that the rabbis want to capture. Uh, again, I'm sort of thinking out loud with you here. Uh, Ron and then Nelson. I didn't want to go on. 
Um, I'm way off here. Change the blessing. <laughs> all right, you're making, all right, so just to, I want to make sure I translate here, right? You're I, making I, the I'm going claim. all the way back to Bereshi. I love it. So you're making the claim that uh, we, the blessing should mirror like creation in the story of creation, uh, in the story of creation where God said, Vayahi, and it was the thing was, or it is the thing is existing. Um, and uh, and maybe we should say the same for this blessing. And there was bread. Amen. Certainly, certainly a claim worth making. Uh, Nelson. Well, Karen got me thinking that often, for example, at Shul, uh, the bread was made the day before because it came from the bakery. But at home, it might have been made that afternoon. So it really is much more present than the bakery bread. And, and maybe probably this was the same thing true in the rabbi's time. Did, did, did they... I mean, I assume they had bakeries and they could have purchased the bread the day before in the market. Absolutely. Definitely. I mean, like in some sense, we are only always living in the past, right? Because we can't live in the future. And, you know, if we want to take sort of neuro neurology into it, right, we're always living, you know, fractions of a moment behind uh, reality. Again, the rabbis certainly don't know that. Um, but yeah, Nelson. I want to make an, kind of an Adam Smith uh, type point that in order for grain to come to the marketplace, somebody really had to plan it out a long time ago. And the market coordinates our activities. Um, and we have to, you know, we have to live in this world of coordination. Yeah, I mean, regardless of the, um, uh, the market piece of it, although I think that's, there's, a, there's a powerful statement there. Um, Certainly, that in order for bread to exist, that work had to have started much, much, much earlier. You can't decide, I'm going to have bread and then plant wheat that day and want bread that day. The process had to have started so much earlier. I think that point is well made. Absolutely. Uh, David, I'm going to give you the last word here. So I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to tie this together. Uh, and if it's clumsy, please step in and, and uh, help me. But... So lechem, we understand as bread, but we could also understand more broadly as food. And when we say this bracha with bread at the table, we're often eating other foods with it. But even if we weren't, and even if we wanted to say that in the past and the not, not too distant past at that, bread might've been the only thing on the table or one of the few things on the table, except maybe on Shabbat and, and Yom Tov, I think it's a very powerful statement in a sense that it's motzi lecha minhar, it's our ha motzi lecha minhar, it's because it ties together the, to the idea that you talked about earlier that the rabbis have, have uh, given us that we're partners in this enterprise, creation's ongoing and we're partners. So God may have made the wheat, but to get it to be bread, we had to do something with the wheat. And whether we think of it as God let us figure out how to do that, or we think of it as some kind of broad partnership, uh, maybe the fact that it's in both tenses at the same time just kind of expresses that in a different way. Uh, creation happened, but it's also happening. And we're part of that. I, I think that's exactly right. I think we, we live in that, that wonderful, beautiful tension of past and present happening simultaneously. And when we, I think our, we're interpreting collectively here that Hamotzi allows us to live in that moment where Motzi may not have. Uh, Bill, I'll give you the last word. Why don't we say Lechem at all? Why don't we say food? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, if you look in the text of the Gemara itself, I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to come just to, to your point. We use, we use mazon when we say the beer cut. Well, I was going to say, well, mazon refers to food uh, and it is related to um, hamotzi. But here the word for bread is pot, which is a, a Hebrew word for bread. So we already have two words for bread asking ourselves. Now we are challenged to ask the question, was it a difference between pot and lacha? Um, which off the top of my head, I honestly don't I don't know. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll have to unpack that, but yeah, um, we ask ourselves an interesting question to say, why are each, why are the each blessings different? 
Um, the section we didn't get to today was all about blessings over vegetables. Um, that was the second page. Um, the text we're learning was Brachot 38. So if you wanted to look it up later, you could and, and spend some time with it. Um, uh, I, 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 I honestly, I found this conversation very powerful, um, both in terms of theology and, and practicality. And so uh, I, I, I thank you for, for joining class today. And um, I wish all of you an early Shabbat Shalom. And uh, we'll see you next week. Be well, everybody.